Welcome to this lesson on the book of Revelation. I'm looking at it again here, not as a commentary necessarily, not verse by verse through the book of Revelation, but primarily an exploration through a preterist's point of view of the different symbols and images used in the book. I know it's quite irritating to sit through a lecture, or in this case, a video of somebody who doesn't agree with us on a biblical topic, and your, your tendency will be to turn it off or to argue with it. Um, I know it would be mine. I've gone through very many different views of the book of Revelation over my years. When I was first in church through my early years, I had no view of Revelation. Our church didn't actually focus on it, and I wasn't aware of anything. By the 80s, I ran into Hal Lindsey's book, or I guess that was early 90s, The Late Great Planet Earth. And I just accepted it as the biblical interpretation of Revelation and was then swept up in the idea of the rapture and pre-mill theology. I wound up later, around 2000, reading Tim LaHaye. I was introduced to Revelation also through Joel Rosenberg. I uh, spent many years watching Jacques Von Impey and following his views. It was not till I was listening to Hank Hanegraaff that I started to understand that there was another view. When I first heard him, I really appreciated his teaching on many subjects. But as he spoke on Revelation, I actually thought he was quite heretical. I thought perhaps he wasn't accepting the Bible at face value. Perhaps he was coming at it from a liberal point of view. I started to listen to him, though. And then one of my heroes of the faith, R.C. Sproul, I heard teaching the same views and I had the same reaction at first. I thought there was something wrong with his view. Slowly but surely, I paid more and more attention to it and saw the logic of it. He'll say he's gone through every point of view on the book of Revelation, and I would pretty much agree with that myself. I've been pre-mill, pre-trib, uh, post-mill, ah-mill. I probably fall somewhere between post-mill and ah-mill right now. Here's the Hank Hanegraaff book. He will not call himself a preterist. He just says that he's being true to the Bible that his eschatology is exegetical. A few more books, Michael Brown on not fearing the Antichrist. He's a pre-mill. I love this book. I have the rabbis look at the last days, what Jesus really said about the end of the world, a Catholic response to uh, the pre-mill view, the rapture trap, Tremper Longman looking at Revelation through the eyes of the Old Testament, and most of my ideas will be reflecting Gentry's books, Before Jerusalem Fell and Navigating the Book of Revelation. Uh, his views are also reflected in Brian Godawa's book about prophecy. I've also studied the book of Revelation through third millennium, doing an undergraduate course on it. And I've done Paul Blackham's study on Revelation through book by book. That's not to say that I'm right or an expert on the book. Just that I haven't just absorbed the first view that came along. I've weighed many different views. I've held many different ones. And it's the Kenneth Gentry one that sits best with me right now, viewing the revelation through the eyes of the preterist, where most of the prophecies were fulfilled with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. My objective with this course and my prayer for myself and for any reader or student of it would be that God will fill us with the joy commensurate with the faith he has graciously given us, the hope of our resurrection and Jesus' glorious second coming, and the strength to persevere through all trials and temptations as they come to us through Satan, the world, and our flesh. I pray that the images of Revelation are seen as the unifying capstone to God's scripture and to redemptive history, and that any fears or trepidations surrounding its reading are replaced by the comfort of knowing our sovereign God. One of the things that makes me most comfortable and happiest with this view of Revelation is seeing that Jesus was, while certainly more than an Old Testament prophet, definitely in line with an Old Testament prophet. He was coming to give the judgment on Jerusalem, just the same way that Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel were doing. On top of this, his prophecies came true. We don't have to make up new meanings for words. We just take it at face value looking forward as he would be to the destruction of Jerusalem and seeing that it is fulfilled. It gives us a lot of confidence, too, in interpreting this book of the Bible. Revelation, obviously, is one of the most debated and the most confusing books of the Bible. When I was young, I knew very little about it, and I'd heard only a couple of sermons or lessons on the apocalypse. I probably heard somebody on TV talking about it, because when I did think about it, I was actually frightened by the imagery, 
and the prospect of going through the Great Tribulation. When I was reading the Bible as a child, I would often avoid reading Revelation when its turn came. I had completed the Bible straight through and would have to persevere through Revelation, but I know there were several times I skipped it. I don't think yet at that time I had heard about the rapture, but by the 1970s, this dispensationalist view was becoming popular, and I started to hear about it in popular culture. As I mentioned, I ran into it in the 1990s reading Hal Lindsey's book, in the 2000s, I was more interested in my faith, and that's when I came across the Rosenberg book and Jacques von Impey on TV. I joined the millions of Christians before me who had believed that Revelation had been directly written for my generation. It predicted the events that would only make sense in our modern era, and that had us rushing toward the end of history in our lifetime. As I continued to study, though, I realized that many people had believed this about their own epochs throughout church history. Why was ours the only generation in which the prophecies of Revelation would make any sense? Why did the greatest exegetes of all time often think that they were living in the last days of history when it was not yet to come for another 500 or 1,000 years? We know even that John Huss, Martin Luther, John Calvin, they could all see the Antichrist in the Roman Church, and they all thought that they were living in the end times just as people today think. I realized that the cultists and the prophets of the 19th century were convinced time and again that the end of history was coming upon specific dates within their generation. Whenever it didn't occur, they just adjusted their readings of the text. Not only had those previous pundits done so, but now so were those in my era. Different villains came on the contemporary political scene, and different authors identified them each with the beast or the antichrist. The authors I had read who had been convincing were not in agreement with each other, and they kept us on the edge of our seats with every new development in the geopolitical realm. The Worldwide Church of God came into prominence in the early 19th century, and they taught that Germany was the great player in Revelation. Of course, this made sense when Hitler was the main villain on the world stage, but in the 1980s, with the threat of nuclear war hanging over our heads, the pundits were convinced that Russia was the great evil that would attack Israel. After the Gulf War, with our eyes turned toward Iraq and the Muslim religion, Babylon in Revelation was seen to literally be the renewal of that empire in Iraq. I was realizing that the end times teachings were making a wax nose out of Revelation and that it could be made to fit any situation. Even though these thoughts were starting to fray the edges of my dispensationalist thinking, it was still intact. It was natural to have disputes and confusion with such a deep and complex book as Revelation. But by 2008, I was in a reformed church and studying different teachers such as R.C. Sproul, and I started to learn about covenant theology and other reform doctrines. Overall, I was very impressed with the teaching of both Sproul and Hanegraaff. I'd only started to become really acquainted with premillennialism, great tribulation, and dispensationalist thinking, and then both of these teachers were arguing against it. I initially thought they were heretical when they started to talk about the way many of Jesus's prophecies in the New Testament's Olivet Discourse had already been fulfilled in the first century and that Revelation pointed strongly to events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. I kept studying them nonetheless, and before too long, I realized that their arguments made a lot of sense. I read the Bible over and over, from beginning to end, and I saw that this view tied the book of Revelation to the entire Bible, Old Testament and New. There was a cohesion and a logic to it that the other views didn't seem to have. Not only that, but it demonstrated once again the accuracy of the Bible's prophecies especially those of Jesus and the writer of Revelation. R.C. Sproul taught that he had held at one time or another just about every possible view of eschatology, and that his current belief was called preterism or semi-preterism. This means that the prophecies of Revelation were meant to be relevant to John's first century audience and were fulfilled within their lifetimes. This is not hyper-preterism, which claims that everything that is foretold in Revelation happened before the fall of Jerusalem, though. Preterism does not hold, for instance, that the general resurrection has happened in some spiritual way, or that Jesus will not still return to render final judgment. But it does entail that most of John's prophecies had contemporary reference. Since that slight conversion, I've done several studies on Revelation, and I've read over a dozen books on it. One author wrote that the definitive book that would lay to rest the dispensationalist notions was Before Jerusalem Fell by Kenneth Gentry. Like R.C. Sproul, Gentry had previously held other views, having been a dispensationalist and a premillennialist himself. Like me, he resisted the preterist view when he encountered it. He studied under the great presuppositionalist apologist Greg Bonson and was slowly won over by his arguments and his exegesis. 
before Jerusalem fell was written as Gentry's doctoral thesis, and it demonstrates that Revelation was written before AD 70, and that this knowledge is crucial to properly interpreting John's prophecies in the Apocalypse. Gentry points out that John's Gospel uniquely does not include Jesus's Olivet Discourse, and that the book of Revelation is his commentary on that teaching. This current course is a study of his views in that book, other books that he's written, and other books by people who follow his teaching. My prayer is that you find this view as exciting, hopeful, encouraging, and comforting as I do. More importantly, I pray you find it to be true to the Bible, and that it helps you to love Jesus and worship God better and better. Revelation ties into the entire Bible with streams of explanation flowing back and forth through every section. It truly is the capstone of God's special revelation to man. Gentry points out that in order to properly interpret the book of Revelation, we need to know when it was written. As Sproul has pointed out when dealing with the difficult warning passages in another tricky book, The Letter to Hebrews, we could be much more definitive in our analysis if we knew who wrote it, to whom he wrote it, and addressing what questions. Premillennial dispensationalists require that Revelation be written in about AD 96, after the destruction of the temple and during the reign of Domitian. On the other hand, when arguing for his amillennial view, Pastor Doug Wilson was challenged that in order for it to work, he would need to show that Revelation was written before AD 70, that is, before the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. This is easier than you would think, he responded. I don't know if it is particularly easy, but it definitely is the view of Sproul, Kenneth Gentry, and Hank Hanegraaff. Gentry's book, Before Jerusalem Fell, makes a case for such an early dating. I'll touch on some of his evidences from that book and also marshal his shorter summations of the case from his book, Navigating the Book of Revelation. Up front, I admit that I'm predisposed to accept the early dating of any and all of the books of the New Testament, and I've been convinced by various scholars that each one of them, including the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, predates the destruction of the temple in AD 70. One of the key reasons I accept this dating is that none of the books mentions this destruction. The temple, as we'll see throughout this study, was of prime importance to Israel. It was not only their center of worship, but also of commerce and government. It was their very identity. Gentry and Hanegraaff argue that to the Jews, the end of the old heavens and the old earth referred to the loss of the temple. Such a monumental event would not have gone without notice in the New Testament's 27 books if it had already occurred before they were written. The fact that Jesus was clearly and continually prophesying such an end to the temple and of the cult of Judaism also tells us that it had not happened within the writing of the New Testament. The authors of the books would have been all too eager to point out that this ground-shaking prophecy had come to pass and that Jesus had been vindicated. To criticize this view, you'd have to say that the New Testament testimony was faked after the fall of the temple. They would have to say that Jesus did not predict that the temple would fall but that the books, written after the fact, were written so as to put this historical event into the prophetic words of Jesus. This view is untenable, though, and no longer holds up to scholarly investigation. It is indisputable that at least much of the New Testament, including such prophecy, was written well before the fall of the temple. One line of demonstrating this early writing is that we have Paul's letters tracing to the early AD 50s, with such historical markers as the reference to the proconsul Gallio, in Corinth being confirmed by archaeology. This is a quote from Hanegraaff. A consensus of both liberal and conservative scholars dates the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians to AD 50s, no more than 25 years after Jesus's death. Most critical scholars will even admit that the traditional creed handed down by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 can be traced back to within months or at least a few years of Jesus's crucifixion, placing it in the mid to late AD 30s. In fact, some will say it was formulated days after his death. We also have the Book of Acts, closing most likely before the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in Rome in AD 64. The Gospel of Luke has to predate this writing since Acts is its sequel, and most scholars put Luke after Mark and Matthew. So we are getting well into the AD 50s for the Gospels as well as with some of Paul's writings. The book Eyewitness to Jesus makes the case that we have actual fragments of Mark found in the caves of Qumran which would have to have been located there no later than AD 68. That's uh, Karsten Peter Thede's book. As I paused the video to look for that book, I also located a couple more that I've got. Praying the Book of Revelation, David Jeremiah's book on the Armageddon, and the meaning of the millennium, 
or different views. Those aren't relevant at this very moment, but I thought I'd add them to this little visual bibliography. Independent of these general evidences, Gentry teaches that there are many lines, external and internal to the Bible, that show Revelation itself was written around AD 65 to 66. The general idea of this early dating needs to be established at the outset of the course, but many of the particular evidences can be introduced later in the course when they become relevant to a particular subject. For instance, Nero is fairly clearly referred to by the Gematria 666, or actually 666. And since he died in AD 68, Revelation would have to have been written before that. Further in this course, the actual demonstration that he is the figure in question will be made. From a personal perspective, I would like to point out how satisfying it was for me to find out that the prophecies in Revelation point to real historical first century people and events. This evidence greatly increases the confidence we have in the reliability of the Bible, whereas the speculations and subjectivity of other views diminish it in my view. The other book I'm referencing, Navigating the Book of Revelation by Gentry, reminds the reader that the events of AD 70 are immensely significant and necessary steps in God's redemptive historical plan. With them, the Old Testament is closed, and the New Covenant is permanently installed with the removal of the Temple. Christianity is forever broken away from Judaism, and the true religion is freed of a land border, a city, a temple, a particular race, and the sacrificial religious rites. Christianity and God's redemptive plan for man becomes universal. A new heavens and new earth are inaugurated. Quoting him, Jerusalem's catastrophic destruction is anticipated everywhere in the New Testament. To miss the significance of AD 70 is not just to miss the meaning of an important historical event, but to misunderstand much of the New Testament message. That's from Navigating. To make this point abundantly clear, Gentry selects the book of Matthew, which he points out is very Hebraic in nature. As an aside, Revelation is the most Hebraic of all the New Testament books. To show that the New Testament relentlessly presses the significance of AD 70. Throughout the Gospel, Matthew is preparing his readers for the rejection of Jesus by the Jewish authorities and the destruction of their temple. The punishment on Jerusalem for this rejection of the Messiah is the very theme of Revelation, as stated in Revelation 1.17, according to Gentry. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns the disciples that they will be persecuted by the Jewish leaders because of their allegiance to him. For the Jews also persecuted the prophets before them. That's Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Thereupon, he denounces the scribes and Pharisees as false teachers who mislead the people, Matthew 5, 20, and hypocrites, Matthew 6, 5. This is still from Gentry's book, Navigating. This is early attestation to the shadow cast upon the New Testament regarding what is to happen in history and what Revelation also prophetically announced. We need to add one important caveat before advancing the Preterist case too far, though. As Hank Hanegraaff says, quote, Of course, the fact that the book of Revelation is predominantly focused on four future events should not lead anyone to suppose that Revelation is exhausted in the Holocaust of AD 70. As with the unfolding in the whole scripture, the book of Revelation points forward to the restoration of all things, a time in which Jesus will appear a second time. The problem of sin will be fully and finally resolved, and paradise lost will become paradise restored. That's page 93 of Hanegraaff's book, The Apocalypse Code. Revelation encourages our hope in this glorious second coming. It does not weaken it. 